at age 16. The family first settled in Farmington and then they moved to Logan. Um, and he was quite prominent in Logan throughout his whole career. Started out, uh, the family business was that of a sawmill. He was called by President John Taylor to be superintendent in the construction of the Logan Tabernacle. He was partway through that when he was called to be the superintendent of construction on the Logan Temple. His background was in construction. He and his father owned the sawmill, Cardin Sons and the sawmill. And uh, that was pivotal to, go to the construction of both buildings. And uh, one of Card's responsibilities in building those buildings was the sawmill up the canyon. He had to keep that uh, manned, if you will. People, part of his travels were in recruiting people to come and work. Uh, in the sawmills and recruiting men and women to go work up there because the women were cooking and, and uh, you know, ma doing maintenance up there while the men were cutting down the trees and, and creating the, whatever was needed for construction. Charles would go out to the stake and the ward conferences and he would recruit at these conferences. One of the stories that to me is most interesting where he's going up Logan Canyon and he goes up as far as he can in the horse, with the horse, riding the horse. He, the horse just can't move, the snow is so deep and so he gets off the horse, puts on his snowshoes and hikes the rest of the distance to the meeting where again he's recruiting people and meeting with other church leaders and stake leaders. He's not only recruiting them to work in the sawmill, he's recruiting them to work on the temple itself. He would have to recruit with the Masons. Uh, there was a quarry up there that he was recruiting for, and he makes trips up the canyon to the quarry and to the sawmill to, to uh, lift the spirits of the men, to hold meetings with them. His wives, by the way, went up and did a lot of the cooking. I see his job, if I was to characterize it with synonyms, would be to be a manager, to be a uh, a people person to, uh, to recruit, uh, to make sure that things were going the way they should be going according to the way the architect had, had drawn the building. He makes trips to Salt Lake reg quite regularly too, to meet with the architect and to meet with the general authorities and to report to them because they were very much involved in how things should look, uh, how things were put together all the way down to some of the little details and how the, the doors looked and, and the colors and, and those kinds of things. So he would meet quite regularly with the architect and uh, I, his responsibility was to make sure that the construction was taking place as the architect had drawn. Charles Oricard was a worker, a tireless worker. The workforce for the building of the Logan Temple uh, came from the able-bodied men and some women from three stakes. Uh, the Box Elder Stake, which is on the uh, west side of, of the hills that's, that make up the Cache Valley. The Bear Lake Stake, which is uh, located on the east, on the other side of the east hills that make up the Cache Valley, and then individuals in the Cache Valley Stake. Uh, priesthood holders were uh, expected to work on the temple uh, on assignment from the bishops, but early in the construction of the temple they realized they were not going to be able to do it adequately with just volunteer help, and so some of the workers were paid. And the members of the church donated uh, cattle and uh, hogs and sheep and uh, uh, other animals. They had a, a temple, uh, the dairy herd, which provided uh, milk and cheese for the workers. They, they had a temple slaughterhouse that they used to slaughter some of the cattle that, that was given to them to provide meat for the workers. And people also donated the food from their gardens, and so they would feed the workers this way, and then some donated money, and so the workers could be paid. In 1877, when the cornerstone was laid for the temple in Logan, the women immediately were assigned uh, to help provide clothing for the workers of the temple and their families. And this they did by just asking the women to either donate money, and often that money was just a matter of five cents here and there, sometimes as much as a dollar. In 1877, there was not a great deal of cash available to 
uh, families so that it was difficult to raise money, and yet they did. And one of the interesting programs for raising funds had to do with the widows in Cache Valley. It was called the Widow's Might Program of Raising Money. And over a seven-year period from the time that the assignment was first given to the Relief Society to the dedication of the temple in 1884, the widows raised nearly $2,300 just by giving their might. Another interesting way uh, that was a means of raising funds and supervised by the Relief Society was the Nickel Fund, which was a fund in which primary children and the, the younger people in the Young Women's Association and Young Men's Association would simply donate nickels that they had earned uh, for the temple. And one young fellow who had donated his nickel on several occasions, uh, went on the construction side of the temple where children were not permitted to go, but he said, I want to see what my nickel is doing. And he was permitted by one of the builders to climb up on the scaffolding and see the construction of the temple to that point. And he was very pleased about that. But uh, the women throughout that seven year period until the dedication continued to give their their dimes and their nickels and their dollars occasionally and, and their food and other clothing in order to, to help in every way that they could. And this was very typical. This tradition had begun with the Kirtland Temple and it had continued with the Nauvoo Temple and certainly with the Utah Temples. The wood was uh, gathered from uh, groves up uh, Logan the Canyon, 25 miles from the site. Immediately after the groundbreaking, the Latter-day Saints rushed up the Logan Canyon. They already had some of these groves of pine trees staked out and uh, staked their claim to those trees because the Utah the Northern Railroad had officials that also were looking at some of those same trees for the creation of ties for the building of the railroad. But the uh, members of the church got to those groves, they built uh, uh, houses for the workers to live in, and uh, they also had uh, lime kilns where they burned some of the trees to, and, uh, and from the charcoal, they had a mixture that made the mortar for the temple. Actually, in the building of the Logan Temple, the Utah Northern Railroad was helpful in that area because as they got uh, further along in the construction of the temple, they needed cash. And they sold some of the lumber that they had cut in their lumber uh, mills to the Utah Northern Railroad for ties, and, and that gave them needed cash for the building of the temple and for the payment of the workers. And so, actually, there was kind of a cooperative effort, and you can understand that because the first superintendent of the Utah Northern Railroad and its construction was Moses Thatcher, who was also the, the president of the Cache Valley Stake while the temple was being built, and so he's certainly not going to be at odds with the building of the temple, and so there was cooperation and, uh, and the railroad uh, assisted in some ways. Now, it may have taken some workers who might have worked on the temple, but uh, there isn't any evidence from the primary sources that that was a major problem. One of the tragedies in this uh, whole experience was there were two workers who uh, were driving uh, loads of, of teams with lumber. They were coming down out of the canyon and were caught in an avalanche, which uh, suffocated the two men and their horses or the, and their, their teams and they um, workers frantically tried to dig them out but were not able to get to them in time. Both bodies were recovered and funerals were held uh, for them. Their uh, horses were also uh, recovered early in the spring. Joel Morris was the uh, lead bullwhacker, and the oxen would obey him uh, his every command. But early in the construction of the temple, the, the J. Golden Kimball, who's very famous in Mormon lore, uh, and who lived in Bear Lake, came down, and Joe Morris 
asked Jay Golden Kimball to drive this long stream of oxen. Later, Jay Golden Kimball told the story that he said those oxen went in every way but the way he wanted them to go. When he talked to them in gentle tones and using kind language, and he said even though it was after the moratorium on swearing, he finally had to resort to language that he had learned earlier in his life before he became more faithful and was working on the temple. And he swore and he cussed and he cursed and he said those oxen were church oxen and they understood language like that and they began to obey and uh, Morris was tickled with the way Jay Golden uh, won the allegiance of the oxen and he had no, no more trouble as a bullwhacker. The Logan Temple is made out of uh, sandstone and that was produced uh, or was quarried locally. There were three quarries. The main one was in Green Canyon, which is just uh, two miles, two or three miles from the Logan Temple. And then there was also some sandstone that was quarried in uh, a quarry in Hyde Park, which is located just three or four miles up the north of the Logan Temple site. And then the um, limestone, which they could put on the windows edges, which is a softer stone, that was quarried in Franklin, Idaho, which is just at the north end of the valley, the oldest community in Idaho. And uh, so there were those three rock quarries from which the stone for the building of the temple came. My family didn't come west until after the temple had long since been built. But my wife's side was instrumental in the building of that glorious structure. Robert Crookston, one of my wife's great-great-grandfathers joined the Mormon Church in 1840. In 1846, when Brigham Young started moving westward, Robert Crookston came with him, and he was in Salt Lake City from that point and other parts of the state until 1864 when he determined to come north to Zion, to Logan. And it was there that he began working on the tabernacle in the 1870s, and that was under construction, and he worked quarrying the stone and laying the stone for that beautiful structure. And when that was completed in 1877, work was starting underway to start gathering the materials to build the Logan Temple, and he worked on that as well. He also built the Mendon Church House and the Fourth Ward Church House, all of that donated, even though he was a professional mason. Henry Ballard joined the church in Thatcham, England, when he was 17 years old. He was a farmhand, and the, the farmer that he was working with, a man by the name of Kimber, had joined the church, and he taught Henry the gospel, and Henry joined the church. But uh, when his family found out, they, they were very upset. His parents just almost wanted to disown him because what he'd done, and his older brothers wouldn't even talk to him. And uh, then after uh, a little while, the, Henry came down with uh, typhoid fever. He almost died, and there came a knock at the door, and it was two missionaries. Now this is the Ballard home in Thatcham. And uh, my great-great-grandfather said, well, he's very ill. He's lying in, up, out of his mind up in his bedroom. And the elder said, well, we'd like to see him. And they finally prevailed. And the, William Ballard, his father, let him go upstairs. And uh, when they went in, they introduced themselves to Henry and asked him if he wanted a blessing. And of course, Henry said, if the Lord has a blessing for me, I need it. The elders anointed him and sealed the anointing and his father watched the procedure. And then shortly thereafter, he had the missionaries teach him, and his father joined the church. His mother was hard, her name was Hannah Russell, but finally she joined the church. Then they immigrated and left all the brothers uh, stayed in England, but father and mother and Henry came west. He finally found himself in the Salt Lake Valley Brigham Young just told him to go north. I think that most of the people moved out according to what the president of the church wanted him to do.